And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Kim Hoskins, who during her near-death experience went to a beautiful garden, and today we're going to learn about it. Kim, thank you so much for being my guest, and welcome. Thank you. Well, you've actually had multiple NDEs, so if you don't mind, let's just start with your first one. Okay. My first one happened in March of 2015. Um, I would say around March 7th or 10th, something in that, that area. I was born with genetic heart defects and I have a medical condition called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And what that is, is it's an extra electrical pathway within my heart that interferes with the rat, the normal rhythm of my heart. So on this day I woke up um, and I was having, my heart rate was really high and I was having severe chest pains. Um, and I woke up and it was dreary. It was rainy. It was, I live in Michigan. So in March of, in Michigan, it can be dreary, but it was interesting because when I woke up, the outside was dreary, but there was like a, a golden, almost like a golden light that was, um, that came from somewhere and it um it followed me and it was warm it was um um it's it's like it was streaming in and but it was it was dreary and raining outside and we were there was we, we weren't even having buds but yet there was budding of flowers budding of um some kind of a buddy. I, I can't describe it. So I woke up and I was having such bad chest pains. I ended up calling 911. And everywhere I went in the house, like I was freaking out because my, my heart was going so fast and it was hurting. But yet there was this light that was, it was like a light, like a golden honey color. And it was soft. It wasn't like the sun where it can be blinding. It wasn't that way. It was almost subtle. And, um, it seemed to follow me as if it, it was a, it was around me. And I called 911 and they came. And the entire time that I was waiting for the, the, the ambulance to get here, this light was that with me. It was almost like, you know, when you, when we have a rain and then we, we have this, a rain and then, um, like a storm and then the rain there's drops of, of like water drops and um, if you were to look at like after a rain when everything is still wet and you would look through a, a raindrop towards the sun that's what it looked like which is I know is it, it doesn't even make sense but it was it was iridescent it was warm it was gentle and I don't like get up in the morning and say, oh, the, the sun is really gentle. It wasn't the sun. It was something else. I was crying because I was in pain, but I was not scared. And um, by the time they got me in the ambulance, my heart rate was up. I, I was in um, tachycardia. My heart rate was up. A friend of mine met me at the hospital. And in the ambulance, it, it, there was this light was still there. It was soft and like golden honey and it, it was like I, I can't describe it how it was and I'm trying to grab it right now to show it like see you can grab it but I couldn't grab it it was seemed to be as if I was in it and so when I got to the hospital a girlfriend of mine was there and we went in and in the area of the hospital where I was in the emergency room there was no windows and it was a rainy dreary day out there was no windows and it, it would have been dreary, but it wasn't because there was this beautiful light that was there. And it was, it was almost to say it was soothing. I don't know how to describe that because I've never seen a light as soothing, but this light was there and I was having chest pains, but I wasn't, I wasn't as freaked out, which I don't, I don't understand why I normally would have been scared. And um, they could not bring my heart rate down. Nothing they did could bring my heart rate down. It was going going up, up, up. And it was it, at to the point where I could have died. So my the doctor came in and he said, 
we need to talk to you. And he told my girlfriend to leave the room. And so he said, we're going to do, we're going to have to put you into, we're going to have to do a procedure on you. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to place you into cardiac arrest. We're going to wait 30 seconds. And then we're going to, pro- we're going to pronounce you as in, we, w- we would, they pronounce me medically dead. And we're going to wait 30 seconds and then we're going to bring you back. And the medicine was adenosine. And um, I'm not real familiar with exactly what adenosine did. It, it, if it's the one that stopped my heart or it's someone that brought me back or if it's God that brought me back, I don't know. But there was um, a, the doctor, the cardiologist was in and there was three nurses. So I had the cardiologist at the monitor. No, the cardiologist was at the monitor afterwards. The cardiologist was holding my, like my torso down, uh, my legs, my torso, because I was, I was going to flail. And the nurses, one, one nurse was like up here holding me. Another nurse was down here. Um, my arms were being held down and my legs were being held down. Now, I, because I didn't look at them, it's hard to say which one was where. And I could feel them. But there was also something that was holding my head. And there was nothing to hold my head. It, it was as if there was some presence or something really gentle and comforting that was holding my head and and on one of those hospital beds there's no place for anything comforting on your back on your head but I felt total peace and they said it's good you're going to have a different experience and they said you know just I said well what's going to happen they said it's going to be a very spiritual experience it's going to be very different and what happened is that the light that golden light became more, um, more, it, it became, it, it was, I could feel it. It wasn't just that I could see it or that I could feel it like on my skin. I could feel it in back, like the back of my head, holding my head. Like it was something like the arms were around my head. I felt that. And while that was happening, they were holding me down. I was, my body was flailing, but I wasn't flailing. My body was flailing, but I wasn't flailing. The part of me that thinks, not the part of me that thinks and has a constant commentary about all the wrongs that I do or all the wrongs other people do me. That's not, that's not the me that was there. It was the me that when that is like a knowing um, we have to, like, we have a, a, we can hear ourselves think. And then, then there's another voice that may come in and, 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 and ha- it isn't, it, it wasn't judging me. It, it was just, I, I can't describe it. I don't even know how to describe this in words, but that part of me, the part of me that runs my body not the part of me that my body runs, but the part of me that's in here and in here, the part of me that was running my body is what, when I talk about me, right, then this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the me that is always, always giving me a commentary about every bad thing I've ever done in my life and everybody who's ever wronged me. It wasn't anything like that. So what happened is during this experience, the light was more, calm and more warm and it it's like it was holding me I only way I can describe it is like a mother holding their baby when my mother would hold me in in a comforting way it felt like that um and the golden was coming in more the the golden followed me the golden light followed me but it was coming in more it was like it was seeping in and as it was seeping as it was seeping in there was some darkness like on the edges of it. This is the entire time I'm supposed to be paying attention to what the, that they've just, they're going to kill me. And I'm not paying attention to that because this light was so beautiful and so loving. And as like my vision on the edges of my vision, you know, we have our edges of our vision on both sides. It was the, 
the light, there was darkness that started to come in. But as it came in more, the golden seemed to come in more than that. It was as if the golden light was penetrating the darkness. There was never total darkness. And at, and what happened is that I could feel me, the me that that isn't kind of commenting all the time on the things I do wrong. I could feel me there. And um, it was it was so loving and it was so beautiful. And that is really what I was focused on was how beautiful that light was and how it felt because it wasn't anything that I'd ever seen before, but it's not this, it's not, it is similar to the sun, but it's not, it's more golden and it's not, you, when you're in the sun and it's hot, it's hot. That's not how it was. It was perfect. At one point, um, they put something into my vein and my vision um, it was like darkness seeped, but then as darkness seeped, the, it was like the darkness was trying to seep in and the golden light was here and it was coming, but it wasn't coming at me like a hand. It was just soothing and it was so gentle. It was pulling me away. I felt as if this golden light was pulling me away, but not like grabbing me and pulling me, but making me want to want it. I'm going to cry because I can't do anything else. Um, at one point, I um, I was not the me that runs my body was leaving. It was as if I was feeling like I was becoming unhinged, but I was awake. Um, it would be so much easier if I hadn't been awake to try to describe it. Um, but there was a point when uh, the golden light was there and it was enveloping me and it was holding me like a mother would hold a baby um, around me, like literally as if I was being held around me. And then I, I was unhinged. It's like I wasn't I wasn't tethered anywhere. And I started to hear songs and like the um, on the back of the screen on Zoom, there is the you have the the colors of what I call the cosmos. And the, there was a light similar to that. And then I could see these, these like flickers. I call them iridescent drops because the only way I could describe it was iridescent drops of honey. And I was, it was like, I was soaring, but I was on the back, but I was soaring. And the songs were coming to me it was almost as if all of the colors, as I was leave, as the part of me that that always is, was soaring, and songs were coming as if and and it, colors became me. It was as if any colors that came out became me, like we were the same thing. And then I started to hear songs, and some of the songs were like a beat. They weren't. Um, I, there weren't songs that I normally would know here. And then I, I, I heard, um, who do they say I am? No, no, it was the, um, the, um, I, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then, and I'm soaring and I'm feeling it. I'm not hearing it with my ears. My ears were on the bed. My, but the part of me that wasn't on the bed was soaring. And I heard, um, in my father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am there, you may be also. But it was a song. It wasn't what I just... I just said like a poem, it was a song. It was real. It was, it was as alive as that, that golden honey light that was soaring with me. Then I heard, who do they say I am? And it, and then I could hear the song 
um, who are you? And then if you have seen me, you have seen the father. And then I was, um, I was released. I don't know how to describe that released part, but I was released the part of me in me. When I say I, that's the part I'm referring to. Um, It was there. It was in the cosmos. It was as if we were soaring, almost like we were literally soaring, like flying, but not flying. And then all of a sudden it was dark, but I could see the, like the, droplets or maybe stars or whatever that was and um then i i felt like i was on the edge of something not my body not me but i was on the edge of something and it was as if i didn't something was wrong Some, something was wrong or something was strange i didn't understand it and i was trying to had i not been awake maybe it would have been easier but I don't even know if that's true because the part of me that was on the bed is not part of me that was there. So I was seemed to be getting further away from like me here. And then it was as if the darkness was coming in where the light had been coming in before the darkness was coming in, but the darkness was not scary. It wasn't anything that I would be afraid of. It was just plain peace and I was sorry. And then I I heard, what's wrong? And um, I I, I mean, I heard that and I, I heard what is wrong. And then I was searching, like I was trying to find something as if right in this, cosmos I was trying to find something and then I it was like I found the Lord I've written about this and it's easier for me to talk about it in writing I I write poetry and generally my NDs I describe in poetry because I don't know how to do it in any, any other words and then I heard take my hand mommy and I took his hand and then at the same time, when I say then that's hard to describe because it's not then. there's no, then there's no, there's no, there's only now there's not a minute ago. There's not two minutes ago. It is only now. And there is no time in space. We are always here. So I was here. I wasn't there. It was as if there was here on the earth. But when I was, in that space soaring I was there and at the same time I was experiencing that take my hand mommy take my hand mommy and then I heard uh, medical they pronounced medical death and um they they waited but i couldn't i can't tell you how it was only 30 seconds but 30 30 seconds isn't it's not even real the only thing that's real is right now so i heard them pronounce me medical death i the i that runs it it me is me that's sitting here but there's an i inside of me and um then at the same time when i heard take my hand mommy i took his hand um my son was not at the hospital that day. I have one child. I have one living child. I lost, um, I was pregnant with quads when I had him. So I lost three babies. He's the sole survivor of quads. And I've, I've sat here trying to figure out what, what was that? I mean, it's very, it's as real as anything ever was. Take my hand, mommy, take my hand, mommy. But nobody else could hear it. But it wasn't, it was seemed normal. It seemed natural. It seemed soothing. And they pronounced to me. And then all of a sudden, the, the golden light was there, but the golden light was kind of starting to, to pull away. It never left me, but it wasn't so all-encompassing. It, it was as if it was leaving a little bit. And as it was leaving, the darkness was coming in. 
and I was back into the, I was in the room um, and it was dreary again, but there was still that, that, that light. And it felt as if I had drops or I could see drops of honey. And um, as if those drops of honey were touching my body, I can see them in my mind's eye, but I can't describe it. How would drops of honey touch your body? Um, but it didn't matter because it was such a beautiful experience. Then I was back and I was not in, I was not in the cosmos. I got used to the golden light. It was as if it was just a part of, you know, just part of what it was. It wasn't so brilliant. And so, but it was, it, it, it wasn't as brilliant, but it was as brilliant. It seemed to be softer. And then I, um, my husband came and picked me up and I went home and, um, and that was when it ended, but it didn't end. Every time I've had this experience, something stays. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't me anymore. Something had changed in me. So before you actually went to the hospital, you were walking around your house and you saw the golden light. Mm -hmm. How would you see it? Would you just kind of see it out of the corner of your eye or was it behind you following you or was where... it was among me? It was enveloping me. When I say I saw, I'm not even sure if it was my, these eyes, I'm doing it again. My eyes on my face that saw it, it was, it seemed to envelop me. It was as if it was part of me. Um, I had to see it because I can describe it. And I noticed it. I noticed I was walking around. Well, it was beautiful, but it didn't, it didn't come out of the corner of my eyes. It was as if it, I was in it. Is it like, as if your vision became golden? Like every, you yes. know, it was like you were in a golden cloud, like everything yes. had a golden yes. tint to it. Yeah. But it was a very, very, very vivid iridescent golden tint what do you think the source of the golden light is the source of that golden light is god um i call it creation i call it the light i call it allah i call it jesus i call it anything that it's as if it was source mm -hmm. it wasn't separate from me but it wasn't completely me and i experienced that same thing when I went to heaven, um, the light. Do you believe that perhaps God was already kind of preparing you for what was going to happen that day? Yes. I have no doubt. Um, I have no doubt. And this is the first time I've even thought of it that way, but I have no doubt because it had to be. There, there was no, there was no golden light anywhere else. And it was as if it soothed me, it calmed me, and maybe maybe it was preparing me for that. And maybe some further NDEs too. Right. Because right. I came out of that, the first one, not me. And the second one during my heart ablation, um, that, trans that transformed me. Once you got home from the hospital after the first one, did the, did the golden light slowly start to fade? Yes. Yes. The feeling of the golden light didn't fade, but the, the, the scene, the, the scene, there's a scene in addition to a feeling that I can't describe, but this, this, the feeling was there. The scene was fading by the, by the next day, I wasn't seeing that golden anymore. I was just trying to process what had happened to me. And you felt like you just fundamentally changed. You were a different person. Uh, yes, yes. Um, first of all, the fact that there was no time changed me because we live in time here. I mean, it's it, we, we look, it's one o'clock. We got to be there at one o'clock. But in this experience that I had, when I had my, um, when I went to the hospital, I had my cardio version, there was no time there. It was, and everything happened at once. And what happened after I was, I had my experience with a cardio version, I didn't feel like me. I felt something different. I felt something shifting, um, not a fear, a comfort, but 
because I wasn't talking about it, I wasn't, I couldn't even process it properly because I needed words to describe something that I didn't know how to describe. But it eventually, yeah, I, I, the, the light didn't seem to be following me. I didn't seem to be in it. Once I got home and by the next day, I was not in the light, in that golden light anymore. But I had a, a calm feeling. Even though my, I was having chest pains, my heart was shaking, I felt calm. I am an absolute basket case. I am a ball of nerves. I sit in anxiety constantly. I have tremors so bad I can barely function. But I wasn't doing that. And I should have been doing that. I, they killed me the day before. And, and I was still having chest pains, but I didn't feel that way. I felt almost a calmness. Um, and that's kind of been here. It's almost like, almost like the, the anxiety seemed to be subdued. I still get it. But I would normally have been in a panic scared to death, freaking out, crying, everything else, because they just put me in cardiac arrest the day before, pronounced me dead, and then brought me back. I was, I should have been panicked. I wasn't panicked. Hmm. Not even with the pain in my heart, the pain in my chest or the shaking in my heart. My heart was literally doing this inside of me. But there was a calmness that Do you stayed. Do you think that you encountered your son's higher self on the other side? I may have, or I may have encountered his siblings, one of his siblings, maybe, maybe all of them. I don't know. My son calls me mommy. My son is 22. He calls me mommy. Um, and so it was mommy. So it may very well have been. I never considered the higher self of my son. I tried to figure out why I was hearing, take my hand, mommy. And I took his hand. Um, I reached out, he reached out to me, I took his hand. Now, it, it couldn't be anyone but my son, but I never considered that it could be his higher self Let me that is in heaven. So when you reached out and took his hand, are you saying that you saw him? I didn't see him with my eyes. I could see him almost like a mist. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, but not him, not the, when he, if he, he may come out here while we're on, while we're talking the way that I see him now and the way I would see him in person is not the same thing it was clear when he said mommy that had to be my son I don't nobody else calls me mommy so as and as him and I have talked about it, and he's read, read my writings he said mommy take my hand mommy because that happened I said yes and he didn't say anything else mm -hmm. no my son is my son is extremely interested in everything he didn't push me on it. And I didn't, and I, it was, I didn't know how to describe it, but that was, I didn't see with my, I didn't see with my eyes, but I saw with something else like okay. a mist or a, like a spear, something reaching out. I can't, I don't know how to say it. That's okay. A lot of people, if not most or everybody have trouble describing, you know, what happens on the other side. Okay. All right. Well, let's move to your second one. Okay. My second one, May 11th of 2015, I went in to have a um, heart ablation. And I, before, once they got me, they were preparing me for my heart ablation. They were putting all these things on my chest. And I remember being embarrassed because they were all men. And they had me undressed and they were putting things all over me. And I was really embarrassed. That is the last thing I remember. And then I was thinking, I'm embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. And, it, and I, to say this is so tacky. I say every single nurse in that room was absolutely gorgeous. And I was fat. And that's all I could think about. It. Oh, my gosh, why did I have to be? Why do I have to be fat? Why can't they have had some women in here? Couldn't they? Anything. And that's what I was thinking because I was embarrassed. 
then, excuse me for a minute. Then I was, um, I went from being embarrassed to, I was standing in a room, almost like an entrance. I'm sorry. Okay. Almost like an entrance. And it was like a charcoal gray. It was, and it, there was, it was, there was four, like, a wall on one side, wall on the other, something behind me, something in front of me. And my grandparents were there. Mimi and Grandpa, I call them Mimi and Grandpa. Grandpa died in 1995. Mimi died in 2009. I was with her in the room when she died. I remained with her body for three hours after she died. When I experienced God then, it was a chill. I didn't feel this warmth. I didn't see warmth. I saw a chill. I could feel a chill that would leave and enter, leave and enter when I was with Mimi when she passed, but I went from, I was embarrassed because they were putting everything on me and they didn't have anything on to I'm standing there with Mimi and grandpa. I knew immediately who they were. I can't tell you what they looked like. I just knew them by the love. There was something about it that wasn't about my eyes. I didn't have, I didn't have eyes. I wasn't seen with an eye, but I did when I entered the garden And when I saw my dog and when I saw everything that was in heaven and when I was having my review, there was a scene, but not with my eyes. So with Mimi and grandpa, they were with me and we went into the garden together, but it wasn't like there was a door we opened. We just seemed to like move into this beautiful garden. It went from a grayish charcoal color to beautiful, beautiful colors. There was a lilac tree right in front of me right i would say within say two feet from me but then there was everything else too but the this lilac tree was so beautiful i couldn't do anything but stand there and look at it stand there and i didn't even even have legs but there was a form i was in and the um the lilac tree was the colors were a much more vivid lavender I wouldn't say purple. It was a vivid lavender. And it was as if they had, you know, when you see paintings where they put drops of say iridescence or something to make it look iridescent. That's what the, um, the lilac tree looked like. And I was looking at it and I was, I was experiencing everything else too, but I could not stop looking at that beautiful, beautiful lilac tree. And, but as I was looking at it, I was smelling it. I was tasting it. There was, I cannot describe the smell was absolutely the most beautiful smell ever. And the interesting thing about that is that when I came back, I have attempted to replicate that same fragrance here. I have about 500 essential oils. I would particularly put them together, put them in an air, in a, in a, a diffuser. And it was right, but it wasn't quite right. I cannot even come close to getting that. And it wasn't an overwhelming, like a fragrance of perfume. It was, and it wasn't like flowers when you walk into a funeral home and you can smell them and they're cloying. That's not what it was. Now, not only was there that, and that was breathing. Everything breathes. And it was breathing. Like you, I could see, I could see that it was alive. It was breathing. And, um, and also there were other plants. It was an entire garden. There was all kinds of beautiful colors of all of everything was just beautiful. Um, and they're not colors that I can describe from here. Anytime I've looked, I, when I, if I'm researching space or I'm looking at, and they show space outside, you know, outside of the earth, when they're making movies about it, they will show colors that's those colors were in heaven or the garden and um i was so i was experiencing that i was watching the lilac tree the lilacs the grass the um the um the everything breathing and um all at that time i had this overwhelming sense of peace i don't even know how to describe it it was a peace like peace is alive 
and it was a peace. I, you know, I, I felt peace before, but not like that. This was a peace that was a connection to everything else. So as I was watching and looking at the lilac trees and I was looking at all of the beautiful colors and I was watching them breathe and there was a song. And while I, this was going on, I'm sitting down without a body. I felt I had some kind of a form. I seemed to be sitting down on a bench looking all of this is at once. Me and grandpa are there. Everything is happening at once. But I wasn't necessarily seeing with, I could see smells. I could, I, every one of my senses were the same, but different. Like they were, they, they had their own sense, but they were all together. And I was sitting on a bench um, and it was a white, like a white bench. I, I like a, a, uh, a bench that you see in beautiful gardens. It's a white, it maybe mar- I don't even know what that was. I wasn't trying to figure out what it was. I just was noticing it was beautiful. And um, on my right side, coming from the right side of me, as I said, on that bench was a breeze. And this breeze, it was like sitting in a garden, in a, in a garden um, on the most beautiful spring day with a breeze coming in. You know how when we get the breeze coming through our windows and it feels good and you can feel that you can see it felt like that, but it it seemed to be what was responsible for the peace because as it seemed to waft by me, I um I felt love too. I felt love. I felt peace, and um, I wanted to get really close to that breeze, but I couldn't because it wasn't a person or anything I could just grab and get close to but I just couldn't get enough of it, but I was getting enough of it. And as I was experiencing that, I'm looking at all the colors. I'm seeing all of the, um, I'm seeing the iridescent. I'm seeing the golden and the golden light and everything was iridescent and the breeze, the, the light wasn't just like the sun. It was like everything. Um, the only way I can describe it is in the Bible or maybe in Christianity, maybe it's not the Bible. They talk about the streets of gold. That is, I think what that was, but it wasn't a street. It was as if everything was blanketed in the golden light. And maybe that is where we've heard of streets of gold because there were no streets like here streets that were paved in gold. Everything was enveloped in this golden but separate and together um and i started to know i i know i knew of the light i was aware of the light i could see the light but not with my eyes but it was connected with everything else it was like um the breeze and as the breeze and the light were connected they it was as if they were one but they were separate at the same time um and Everything was within the light. I wasn't like this. The light wasn't within me. I was in the light. I was in the breeze. Um, and they were connected. And I, when I tried to think about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, like it was a holy and it was God's breath or it was a breath that was just making everything so beautiful. The whole time, even Grandpa were there with me. I'm noticing that I'm I'm aware of everything, but not an awareness like whoa, well, I'm looking at my eyes. It wasn't that way. It was just an awareness of this extreme beauty, extreme peace. And then at one point, we were. I can't even say one point because there's just not. There's no other place. There's not time. Everything happens at once and all of my senses I experienced at one time. I could um, I could taste colors. I could I, I could see the songs of everything breathing. And then there was a time or, or a mo- no, I can't I, I gotta get rid of that word. Mimi and grandpa and I were in this almost like a room in something. And it was always very beautiful and very loving. 
when it got into this space or this room or whatever it was with Mimi and Grandpa, Mimi and Grandpa and I always had, there was never anything but love between us. Never, never. There was never anything solemn. There was never anything like that when I, when they were here. They were wonderful. But it was, I was sitting and I could see me, I could see me sitting. I could feel me sitting, but I could also see and feel them. And when we communicated with each other, it was like, it was just going back and forth. You know, like I have a thought, their thought. And this is the only time in the garden that it was solemn. Um, I, I was aware that it was solemn, but it was not scary. It was not, um, it was as if we were contemplating something. We were doing something that was solemn. Um, and I had this feeling of, like I was looking, Mimi and Grandpa and I were looking over things in my life that have happened all of it but not not just things but all of it and there was no bad feelings there was no judgment there was only this solemn almost sovereign feeling and um and in the room there was the same light that golden honey light that I experienced when I had my first NDE and that was I was experiencing out in the garden um, and I felt safe. I felt good. It was as if I was, we were looking or thinking about or communicating something to learn from. But when I contemplate something to learn from, I almost feel as if I'm being judged or I did something wrong. It wasn't that way. It was as if, okay, this is what it, this is, you know, like we, we were experiencing something where there was a a review of something and me and Mimi and grandpa I was sitting like in front of Mimi and grandpa and I didn't see them and I didn't see me but I could feel I was sitting in front with them like facing them and um the it was solemn where I, I the only way I can describe it was when I got my master's degree when I was sitting in the, in the auditorium, it was a very solemn occasion, but it wasn't, it wasn't even quite like that. It was solemn and beautiful. And it was as if everything was good. And I don't even, so, but as I, as I re-experience it, because every single time I talk about it, we experience it. I'm sure you can see me doing it right now. I'm going out, trying to grab things, looking up into up into the up into my head, trying to see outside. Um, it was a good feeling. It was a, it was all part of everything. The same time, this the golden light that it was like twinklies, twinkly golden was there, but we were in it. It wasn't standing outside of us. I uh, we were in it. Um, and it, it, there, there was something important that occurred. I cannot remember what that was. I started to get information when I entered the garden and with me and grandpa, even right up, right until then, all of a sudden there was knowledge that I knew. Like answers to questions I'd never asked were given to me. I knew, I just knew. And um, it was, I, I knew things. I knew like answers of for eternities. And it was all part of everything. And that, and when I was experiencing that same thing with me and grandpa, and we were in that room or the building or whatever it was. And it was a solemn experience. And I was, we were in the light, sitting in the light, that beautiful golden light to the left of me was a beautiful, beautiful golden um, field. And it was breathing. It was going back and forth like a straw field. 
that the color I, is similar to that, but much more golden, but it was swaying back and forth. And it went on for about what I would describe to try to describe it as maybe four, four, five, six football fields. It was that long. At the end of it, to the, at the end of it, and then to the left of it, like there was an edge. There seemed to be an edge. And my dog was there and he was a chow chow. I had him, got him when he was eight, six weeks old, and he passed when he was um, 12. And he looked exactly as he did when he was a puppy. He was red. He, I saw, he had a form. He had colors. He looked just like he did when he was here with me. Now, on this side, like, okay, there's to the right side, there seemed to be some kind of a barrier or something that I knew I couldn't go. From that point, all the way over to the right was a bridge. And he was standing on this side of the bridge, the side where I could be. And I seemed to know I couldn't be there. That bridge was really rickety. It looks like we had, I had family that lived in West Virginia. And when we would go on hikes, there were bridges that we would walk across. And my dad used to scare me on him. He would get, we would get on him and he would start shaking him and I would scream and be afraid. That's what it looked like. I didn't experience it where I could sit on it, but it looked like that. It, and that's the way I described it. it was a, a rickety bridge. I didn't run to Clarence. I didn't go to Clarence and Clarence didn't come to me, but we were right here together. Um, even though he was far out and I was here, he was right in my face. I was in his face and, um, we just loved, we just loved, we just loved like we did in, in life. And I don't know if you can hear my dogs right now. They're having a fit because they want to participate too. I'm an, I'm an animal lover. Basically you've given me the choice between an animal and a human. Human doesn't stand a chance. Mm. I love animals. So he was looking into my eyes. I was looking into his eyes and he was red like he was when he was a puppy. He had that beautiful, beautiful coat. And we were just loving. And then I was, I felt a horrible pain in my chest. And I was back in the body that hurt. And I was screaming. So I went from being with Mimi and Grandpa, seeing Clarence, see, hearing these beautiful songs. I had knowledge. I don't have it anymore. It comes back to me sometimes, but I was there. I, it was beautiful. I was aware everything was beautiful and it was love and it was golden. Back to a place where I was feeling horrible pain and I was screaming. Um, but when I, it seems as if when I felt that pain that brought me back, I don't remember the things I should have known. It's, it's like, I, there was something in my communication with Mimi and Grandpa that was like, it's okay. But yet, it wasn't okay because I forgot. If it was okay, why well, wouldn't I have remembered? So the pains were terrible. Apparently, this is when they were shocking me to come back. I immediately came back and said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I was, I had the most beautiful dream. I had the most beautiful dream. The colors were beautiful. Oh my gosh, the songs were beautiful, smelled wonderful. And I was doing that. And I was just, I, I mean, I, they were looking at me and they, they weren't, they didn't seem surprised, but they didn't, it was as if they didn't care. They want to hear it. So I seem to have a sense that it's time to shut up about it. Don't talk about it anymore. And, um, but 
I was in this beautiful, with me and grandpa. When grandpa died, I lost my mind. I didn't want to be here without him. He, and when he died, had there been a choice between him and my dad, there wouldn't have been a choice. I would have chose grandpa. Mimi. Mimi was, is the most beautiful human being there is. I didn't want to leave her. And I was with her. So when she died, when I, I was with her when she died, what I went through was so transformative and painful. And yet, I was with her again. So I, I didn't, I, I started when I came out, I was talking about it and flailing my arms and looking up in the air and doing all the things that I do. Um, and nobody wanted to hear it. it. It was very clear that whatever it is I had to say, I did not want to be heard because I kept saying there was the most beautiful lilac tree. Oh my gosh, there was a breeze. The peace was beautiful. Oh, it was so loving. Oh my, I saw Mimi and grandpa and I was talking and, and nobody said don't tell it they just didn't acknowledge it at all mm -hmm. and um i later found out that um that when i came came to and at some point um i was in the hospital and the um uh, my electrophysiologist had people watching me and reporting back every hour on how i was doing and um i was so busy wishing that I was back with me and grandpa um, and not being able to figure out why doesn't anybody want to hear me tell about this. And then I said, do you, I remember saying to the doctor, do, do you have dreams under anesthesia? And he said, no. Hmm. And I was like, okay, how come I had a dream and I was in this beautiful garden and it was the, li the lilac trees were beautifully smelled wonderful. They, I mean, you could taste you could taste song. It was just beautiful. And um, the doctor ended up telling me that um, I had coded and that um, I should not have been here, that they were preparing to take me to the morgue. Told my husband the same thing. And, um, but I didn't care because I was trying to process what I experienced. And nobody was listening. It was as if I was talking to a room full of people who couldn't hear me. And um, nothing has been the same since then. When you were in that place that was, or in that time that was solemn, do you think you were going either through a life review or maybe you were perhaps being told that you had to come back? I didn't get the feeling that I had to come back. I got the feeling that it, we were looking almost as if we were going back over like a movie theater or movie like flashes of time but I can't tell you what it was other than that there was something that was that was flashes of time in heaven there is no time so I think it was a review but the thing is is that I was raised a Baptist I was raised a Christian a Baptist with my parents and I was raised in the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's Witness with my aunt. And my entire family raised me. My Mimi and grandpa raised me. My mom and dad raised me. My aunt and my uncle raised me. So I had experiences with every single one of them. What I had learned about judgment is um, that it was, we would stand before God and be judged according to whatever we did. And that that would be, determine whether or not we go to heaven or we go to hell so because i couldn't have that experience it took me a while to figure out what that was because i this and what i would get is like flashes like um a projector going through things um and and, and it was solemn and i knew it but it wasn't upsetting and i was in the light um but I, I don't have that back yet. I don't have it totally back yet. So I can't say for sure what that was, but it was clearly some kind of a review, some kind of a, we were remembering or memory or something to that effect. 
Did this NDE change you any more or any differently than the last one? And if so, how? Yes. Um, they, the first one was, yeah, it, it, how did it change me? The first one, I felt more of a sense of peace. When I came back from my second NDE, and then there was a difference even after my third NDE. My second NDE, I was caught up in, I could not, since then, I, do, I don't understand time. I, I have, like when I was trying to reach you, I can't tell you what time it was because I don't, I don't think of time that way. Um, and then I became, there was information. I seemed to be going, you know, living my life. And then I would get, all of a sudden I would know things. Example, I hate numbers. I don't understand numbers. I do not understand numbers. I became and am totally obsessed with, bin with binary numbers. Zero and one, zero and one, zero and one. I don't care about zero and one, but I care about it now. Um, I, um, I got information like I, there were things that, for example, the Trinity. When I say the Trinity, I don't mean it, there, it was three. Like everything is three. Everything is three. Everything is three. There's always three. And I understood the Trinity when I could never understand it before. The Trinity of um, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. I got that. Then I started to get the Trinity in terms of Mother God um, and its connection with Earth. And then I started to get information about the Trinity and everything else. Like everything is in threes. So I became obsessed with zero, one, and three, zero, one, and three, zero, one, and three. But I couldn't really obsess about zero and one because, but the Trinity, I seem to have information about what that meant. And, um, and what I was doing is I was telling my husband every single time I had an experience. So I, he would be downstairs. I would go downstairs. I'd say, okay, now we need to really talk about the Trinity here. You know, I, and then I would say, okay, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. God, the Father is the Father in heaven. Jesus was who came here, same thing. And the Holy Spirit was left. It was, it, and it's, it's in the breeze. So I was associating everything with earth, like Mother Earth, Mary Magdalene, not Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, um, Mother God. It was, I got it. And I would be sitting outside and all of a sudden, I knew it. Then I started connecting with more animals. I connect with animals deeply anyways, but this is not the same. Um, I can go outside, animals come up to me. I know what they're saying. We can talk, we communicate. I communicate with outside. I can hear like the birds are talking to me right now and and it's like we are connected there's no difference between me and the and the birds and the breeze and the trees and mother earth and everything else and um i got um i started to begin to understand about the collapse of time and space that that is not even real it is something that we create here that isn't even real um, and then I started to get information about, like, it would just be downloaded into me. I'd be sitting here doing nothing or doing something and, whoa, I got it. I would get information about God, about who God is, about other religions, about all those things. This, it was like, all of a sudden I would say, you know, honey, everything is truth. It doesn't matter whether you are an atheist, whether you are Muslim, whether you are, um, whether you are Hindu, it doesn't matter if you're Christian, it's all the same thing. And it's all true, except for the dogma, except for the scary part. That's not true. And we've been married for 24 years and now, and it's been about my, my last NDE was in 2018. So, but this occurred in 2015. So I was, I mean, I never sat around and said, you know, honey, you know, let me explain this to you. I just got it. Um, and I would spend hours downstairs with him. And I would see what I do is when I get that, I would go up with my eyes up to the left. And um, if you see, if you notice that while we're talking, I will go up and start looking up to the left. 
And that seems to be where I get things. So I got information about all of it and all of it was truth. And it doesn't matter what your truth is. It matters what it means to you. And it's all designed to give us peace. And um, so I, I will go back and I've gone back to wonder why did I hear songs in Bible, in Bible, Bible scriptures? Likely because that's what I grew up with. I grew up as a Baptist and a Jehovah's Witness and everything was, um, was Bible based. And I, it seemed to be that that was why, but it wasn't the only thing that was real. Um, now I can feel like I'm, I can feel other people's pain as if it's mine. I can feel the neighbors across the street. I know what's going on with them. Animals in particular, I connect with them on a different level. I will be sitting here and say, can somebody please put the dogs out? They got to go potty. And they didn't even say anything to them, but they just told me they had to go potty. And I, and the, my husband said, I don't get up. So I walk and the dogs come around. They got to go potty. Um, we have kittens. We have cat. Our neighbor has cats. We all, we all, it's like our neighborhood has, we have neighborhood animals, our cats. And I know when a mama is having babies and when she's, when she's had them, I know I have this knowing that I never did before. Squirrels. I won't even kill a bug right now. My husband, we have, we have ants and I'm like, there's an ant there. Could you, could you like put it in a toilet paper thing and just put it outside you don't need to squish it well i guess you could squish it it doesn't really matter since it's the soul anyways that body isn't what they I, I start talking crazy and um then i started to um watching tv with me is miserable miserable my husband and son cannot tolerate watching the tv with me because i see something before it's on tv so I will say, oh, this is this is what's happened. And my husband's like, we don't know. I said, no, I've seen it before. He said, no, you didn't. It just came out now. I said, no, it didn't. It's been out because I saw it before. So what happens is that we have to go back to, okay, what's going on? I'm getting information in my spirit that is telling me things. Um I go out in public and I can be in a store. I'm friendly. I'm autistic. I'm a high functioning autistic person and I'm an extrovert. So, you know, some of my, the, the characteristics you may see right now is a lot of it is my autism, but we'll go outside out in the country, out in the store. And I feel something next thing, you know, I'm trying to meander my way over to whoever it is, start talking and then start telling them about their husband and, and their, and I'm like, you know, I, what's wrong with your back and things like that. And, and yeah, and my husband and son are sitting there going, um, could you hurry up, honey? It's weird because I will approach people. Um, I have been to places where people come in and I start telling them about what's going on in their life. I don't, I don't know anything about what's going on in their life, but I know what's going on in their life. So I get information. It's as if I've become like a medium. I um, have always been a writer. My writing is not the same. I've doing, I'm doing automatic writing. I'm sitting down. I'll write. I'm a, I'm a writer on Quora. And I'll answer questions. And I'll start out with a question. And it, it'll start out one way. And I'll start to answer it. And then all of a sudden I have a film over my eyes. I cannot see what I'm typing and I'm just typing away. And I'm typing what I'm hearing, not in my ear, but in my head, I'm typing everything I'm hearing. And what's happening is I'm giving people readings. Um, I've had to process that with my therapist because as a Christian and as a Jehovah's witness, I was told that that was demonic. And the last thing I wanted to do was come back from having demonic. And um, then I, the feeling, I can feel things. Um, then it got to where I started drawing. I can't draw. I can't even write my name. When I write with my hands, it looks like a spider died in ink. It's so bad because I have such bad tremors. One day, 
I just, I'm, hmm, let me just, let me just draw an eye. I drew an eye, a human eye. Now I draw and in my drawings, I will start out drawing one thing. And then when it's all done, it's something else. And when I'm drawing, as long as I don't pay attention to the fact that I can't see it, I'm fine. The second that I pay attention to the fact that I can't see it, I panic and it goes away and I can't do it. But I will spend 16 hours a day drawing. I've drawn my spirit guide over and over and over and over again at various stages. I, I draw this woman as a baby, as a little girl, and as a woman, and as an old woman, and it's all the same features. I will start out to draw my mother. And the next day I look at it, I'm like, this is not my mother. This is the same woman, the same little girl, the same baby that I keep drawing. And my son will say, mommy, why are you drawing babies? I'm not. I'm obsessed with one eye. One, when I close my eyes, I see an eye and I will draw that eye. And it, I mean, we're talking, I could not write with my hands, but I am drawing an eye, all the layers of the eye, all the colors. And then now I will draw, I'll just sit down and just start drawing something. And I'm used to the fact that whatever it is, I think I'm drawing is not what it is. I will think that I'm drawing um, anything and it's an eye. Mm. You know, I may think that I'm drawing it, but I'm drawing an eye. Due to the sake of time, let's move on to your third NDE. Okay. My third NDE occurred during my cancer surgery. I had pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. My cancer surgery was the Whipple. And what that is, it's the removal of half of my pancreas, half of my stomach, half of my upper intestine, or my small intestine, and my entire gallbladder. I have multiple um, arterial anomalies we didn't know about. We found out when um, that my surgeon was removing my, my gallbladder, he cut an artery. And I bled out. And um, all of a sudden, I was in the, in the ceiling, like looking at them, and I could see them. I could see the body that was me on the table, but I didn't care. I could have cared less. It didn't matter. I was just watching them as if, and I was watching them like just not just watching them like hmm, this is this different a feature that really made me angry and made me want to get out of there was this constant beeping was making me mad i never had any feelings of madness in any of my other ndes but this this beeping was getting on my nerves and um and that was as i was in a ceiling in a corner ceiling i was watching down but i could see um on my right side like I, right here there was a spinning something like a fan, but not a fan, but there was a spinning, like this kind of feeling. And um, I was just like, I'm bored. I don't, hmm, don't care. Then I was back. I woke up from my, my surgery. And then I was told that what happened is I went into complete cardiac arrest. I bled out. They had to call in a surgeon to dissect the artery and to, um, they had to dissect the artery and remove it because it wasn't where it was supposed to be. You're not supposed to have an artery on top of your gallbladder, which is why they didn't see it. So that was my final NDE. The difference about that was, is that every other experience was really, really beautiful and really, really life-changing. And that one was just like an annoyance. And that's, I came out of that one with an annoyance. Um, I get more information, but none of my NDEs, I didn't go through a tunnel. My, I've had my pain management doctor, who's an anesthesiologist, my vascular surgeon, and my neurologist who have interviewed me about my NDEs. And I've said, why does everybody else go through a tunnel? That's supposed to be a feature of NDEs. And my vascular surgeon told me, he said, not with people who are going into cardiac arrest. So, and, and so that was very different. I didn't have any feeling at all, didn't care. And that was that one. The only thing profound about that was that I keep getting more information. I keep 
being able to connect with things and people and more than them. Like I can meet, I can have a day with my grandpa just by pulling him back here and we dance to my wedding. I know how to do that. And I can have a whole day where I'm just dancing with my, my grandpa at, at my wedding, which is weird. But that came after that. I never did that before. So I don't understand the reason why I had that particular NDE the way that it was. It sounds like maybe it was just an accidental NDE. Yeah. I never even thought about that before. I didn't even know there could be. Well, yeah, an accidental death would be an accidental NDE because we go somewhere after. I guess we're getting into deep water here because, you know, are are all NDEs accidental or are, are they not? Because some of my guests will say that they've planned their NDEs before this life. I've heard that too. And um, I've heard that too. So... And I, I, I know that's true. Here, here, I can't seem to put the two together, but here I know that's true. It's interesting that your doctors are now researching your NDEs or at least wanting to know more. They had to. Um, after my, uh, my Whipple, um, they had to, the, my doctors got a team of cardiologists together to, because I need open heart surgery. There's another anomaly, and I have a subclavia, a left subclavia, a left subclavian artery that is not supposed to be there. My aortic arc is in a Q shape, and what they want to do is they want to remove the anomaly in the subclavial artery, and they want to attach it to the aortic arc. So they required um, my vascular surgeon to interview me specifically about that for that reason. And when we were done and he, we talked about it, my husband was crying. He was freaking out because he doesn't like to hear about it. And he told me, he said, we, we've got a cardiac team ready to do surgery. You need surgery. And when I was done telling about it, my husband was crying and didn't want even wanted, he couldn't tolerate it. And, um, I said, so what, what is it? What are you going to do surgery? I thought it would be like through my artery, but it would have been open heart surgery. I can't have surgery. I can't have open heart surgery. They won't touch me. Um, I have, um, I'm too much of a risk. So I suspect that that's why he did it. My um, anesthesiologist, he just came out and started talking to me about my NDE. My neurologist came right out and said to me, can we talk about it? And I said, yeah. So I know the third one was directed by an entire cardiac team. And as a result of that, they can't fix my heart. Now, when they're speaking about your NDE, are, do you feel that they believe you when you talk about the other side or are they just talking about the medical aspect of you dying and coming back? No, they want to know about the, about the actual experience. The dying and coming back isn't, they want to know every single detail of the beauty of what I experienced. They want to know everything. And they definitely believe me. My neurologist said to me, he said, I love this. When my uh, Dr. San interviewed me and he said, I've heard this before. He said, we hear it in, in cardiac units. Um, but there absolutely there was no question that they did, that they believed me. No question. And I'm real sensitive to that. If somebody doesn't believe me, I just claim right up. But no, they definitely believed me which was helpful in me disclosing further because if I've got three medical professionals who are talking to me and asking me about my NDEs, not, you know, not what's happening medically, but what was happening to me spiritually, they definitely believe. Where are you at now on your spiritual or religious journey? I don't, um, I do not um, connect with any religion, but I connect with all of them. I see the truth in all of them. Um, I, we are all the same. We are all together. It's as if there's a collective unconscious and that or a soul to gathering. Um, the connection is where I'm at. Um, I've even gone deep into looking at, is this, was this a place that I went like a different world, like a planet? No, it was a consciousness. It was almost as if there was a different dimension within my consciousness that is where this place is. I have absolutely no doubt my mother is there. 
my dad is there, my grandma's there, my gra- Mimi and grandpa are there. And we have a relationship here. They come here. My mom, my mom died in October of 2021 and she won't leave. She's here all the time. And I, I'm, I'm clued in with all of a sudden my TV starts talking to me. It's not on, it'll start talking. So, and the more that I experience that, the more that I start to remember things and but I'm I'm, I just seem to be connecting with everyone in terms of a soul or a spirit I, I I have an understanding of what religion means why it's there and why it's what it's what's important about it but more important to that it matters what it means means to the person so God is not a I don't I, I don't describe God as he or she. Um, we all are in God. I, I remember being told that we had to go to heaven. In order to go to heaven, we had to be saved. And ask Jesus to come into our heart. And No, my experience of God was that God was so big, there was absolutely no possible way to have God come into my heart. We are all in God. We all go home. There is, there. I know that there's been experiences that can be scary for people that have had NDEs, my understanding is that is just part of our doctrine that we've been taught, but it's not real. Everyone goes home. Everyone goes home to the garden. When my mother died, I directed her and I said, mom, we got to talk now. It's time for you to go. I talked to her on the phone as she was actively dying. And I said, mom, let's talk about the twilight. Twinkly's mom, mom, look at the twinkly's now, mom, go. Mom, the twinklies are God. They're just pieces of God. Follow the twinklies, mom. Now, mom, mom, go now. Mom, go to God. Mom, go to God. I love you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. But now, mom, mom, walk. Just mom now and go to God now. And then my sister started crying. I was on the phone. And my sister started crying and um, my mom died and my, Chris, my sister, had, my mom had taken her, her last breath and uh, my sister picked her up and she died in her arms. We had a very complicated relationship. So to be able to tell her to go to God. I could see her walking to God. And that to transcend what we were together here as humans to go into the spiritual and me say, Mom, go to God, go to God, go to God. And she did. I'm not going to be the same after that and that is probably the most profound thing that has happened since my since my NDEs I was able to tell mom it walk with her to God I don't know how many people could do that but if they could I would tell anybody to do that and and I can't really talk much about it now without breaking down in tears because of where it took me Mom and I didn't see each other. But when she was dying, I was with her. We were together. And she went to heaven and died in my sister's arms. I'm sorry. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You had mentioned earlier you're a writer of poetry. Have you written books about your NDEs? I, um... I haven't written books. I've written about my indies. I've written um, my I, one is called um, um, it, it it one is called the um, the glimpse, and then there's another one that I I've labeled um, ascension, and that was the one that I had when I was awake. Um, but I constantly write about it in questions I'm answered and what happens is I end up writing more and more and more about it. And, um, but am I in the process of writing a book? Yeah, I am. Um, 
I just don't know how I'm going to put it all together. It's going to revolve around life, mom, um, death, what that is and what it isn't. There is none. Uh, so I'm going to start writing. I'm, I'm still in the process. I've now just started to keep every single writing I have. I, and when I say I write, like I can get a, be off core for a week and then get noticed that there's 4,700 people that have read what I've written in a, in a week. Mm. So I'm writing. I just don't know where it's at right now. And I've got to pull it together. My son is constantly after me, mommy, you need to pull this together. Mommy, he says, this would be profound. You need to pull it together. Are so you, yes, I'm in the process, but are you saying, or did you say that those poems are out there online for people to read? Yes. Where can they read them? On Cora. They can read it on Cora under KD Hask under KD, KD Lilith. K eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. KD Lilith is my pen name on Cora. And it's, um, it's, um, there that, um, I write mm -hmm. almost daily. I, someone asks me a question about death, grieving, dying, um, even other things, you know, and, or I've written on, um, I, on Cora, there is a group called Hacking the Afterlife. And I've actually been on that documenting the entire experience on Cora when I've had like weekend spiritual experiences. That's where I've documented. Mm -hmm. I've done some writing. I, I will post on Facebook under my name. Mm -hmm. um and people can see it but with Cora it seems like it goes out much further and I just I just write it but that's yeah that's where they can see them maybe you can send me the link and I can just put it in the description below if people want I to will read that. I will I will and speaking of people asking you questions after watching this can they contact you absolutely that is why I'm here that is why that is why I'm here. Absolutely. That I, yes, yes. Anyone it's too, it's so important that, that people know what after is and how beautiful it is and how it changes. Not only if you're having an NDE, the life back when you come back. Yes, absolutely. I am. And in fact, it's funny because I won't put it behind a, a paywall. I will not accept any pay for it. I won't do it. And that's where I don't know how I'm going to be able to do the book because I got these experiences for free. Mm -hmm. I'm not ever going to charge anybody. Anyone can see anything I have at all. Even if, even if somebody were to try to take it and say they wrote it, it doesn't matter. I don't care. It doesn't matter. If somebody feels that they need to take it and steal it and make money off of it, that's what they need. It doesn't change what it is. Mm -hmm. So that is a that's a common thing my son and I are talking about. He's like, Mommy, you gotta be careful because you mm -hmm. you haven't um you you have not public you you don't you're not copyrighted. I'm like, Well, so what? It doesn't matter. If somebody wants to say they wrote it, they they can say they wrote it. It doesn't matter. I'm the one who knows the truth. It doesn't matter. If that will bless them, maybe if they need to say it was written by them, maybe that's what they need to do. It's not for me to say. It is for me to always offer it. Contact me. I'm on Facebook at uh, under Kim Coverdale Hoskins on Facebook. That is my Facebook page and um, KD Lilith. And I will send you the link for, for both. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Everything is as it should be. Always. Always. Everything is perfect as it should be. Any, whatever your truth is, is your truth. And it's always your truth. And every one of us, all of our spirits go home to God. There is no burning hellfire. There's no, there's no punishment. There's no nothing. The only thing after this is just like there was before. It's just beauty and love, connection. Kim, thank you for sharing your amazing experiences with us today. I really appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.